It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is New Jersey. You may or may not know this about me. I grew up in Brazil. And when I arrived in Brazil, the World Cup was going on. I really knew very little about the World Cup. Turns out Brazil plays in the World Cup. And the year that I got there, um, they won the World Cup. And I had never seen anything like that in my life. Uh, this is the Brazil jersey. We all have a team, as it turns out. But other people have other kinds of teams. Some people have political teams. And they wear that jersey like I might wear this jersey. Some people have ethnic teams. And as it turns out, some people have grievance teams. And this one's very interesting. Something happened to them personally or something happened to their team, and no New Jersey. That is it. We're going to wear that jersey to the death. Never let it go. Um, so I have a question for you. If, you. if you were to walk around wearing your jersey, your real jersey, what would it say? What would it reflect? Uh, for, some, for some, their jersey is really none of those things. For some, it's a, it's a jersey of sin. And it's, maybe it's sex. That would be all over their jersey. Maybe it's drugs. That would be all over their jersey. Alcohol, anger, pride, greed. Because if you're more tied to your team, whatever that team is, and again, it may, it may be some sin. And you're like, yeah, I'll come to your church, but I'm not letting go of my team because this is what I'm all about. Or I may come and gather with you as a church, but really our team is not letting go of this thing. It's just, it's just not going to go well, and we're not going to get anywhere because we're all going to show up in different jerseys, and it's going to kind of be a fight. So look at Psalm 133. Verse 1, a song of ascents of David. So this is King David. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now you say, well, I don't want to be like those other people. Don't, don't mishear this. Unity doesn't mean that we all have to be the same. Right? It doesn't mean that you can't bring your background. Look at a marriage. You're, the Bible says the two shall become one flesh. You've got two became one, but they don't use, the two people don't lose their individuality. So somehow you have to figure out how to be one person and move as one and, and make decisions as one and figure out the differences, or it's very hard to be that one. So how do we do that? Now, you say, well, yeah, I like being around everyone, but here's where it falls apart. I like being around everyone like me, everyone that likes me, everyone that thinks the way I think, everyone that believes exactly the way I believe, everyone that sees the world the way I see the world. That's what I'm looking for. So then we come up with it. The, this body of Christ that's basically been chopped up into a million pieces. John 17, and this is Jesus' high priestly prayer. He's praying for himself. He's praying for his immediate disciples and those that would come in this prayer. But 1720, 
He says, I do not pray for these alone, in other words, his followers that were there at the time, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So that would be me. That would be us. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us so that we would sync up on the things that matter. We would be one as the body of Christ, that the world may believe that you sent me. So when we don't figure out a way to let God love us, we love him, we love ourselves, love other people, we love our neighbor as ourself, he comes along later, says, by this wall men know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. So if we don't figure out how to love each other, the world ain't buying it. They're not, they're not in, they're not, they're saying you people can't even get together because of all your differences. But when we are one the way he intended, then the world sees that and goes, you can't do that without him. Okay, so look what happens. What is he after? That the world may believe that you sent me. People start literally, according to this, believing that the Father sent Jesus, that he is who he claimed to be and who he is because of the way we interact with each other. And the way we are connected to him so tightly that we move in unison. Uh, my favorite picture of this, and it's, it seems impossible, if you've ever been underwater scuba diving or seen video of this, you can have a million fish, a million fish, and they move like a swarm, like a body, like you, you, there's got to be spacers somewhere. They don't run into each other, and when that massive school of fish moves and moves back, they all just together like it's one big body. And the purpose for those giant schools in many cases is so that they appear to be bigger together and a a prey can't attack them. So they get together and move together to, to ward off enemies. But here, the oneness is that the world may believe that you sent me. Keep reading, 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. He has given us his glory. I in them, okay, so Jesus saying, I in them, these people I'm praying for, you in me, that they may be, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So not only then does he say that the world may believe, may know that you sent me and have loved them as you love me. So how do I, you know, I didn't know this. I keep telling you this through the years. I never knew that. I didn't know that, G, that God loved me the way he loved his own son. That's mind boggling. Now, can we not get together on that? 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. And I love the way Paul starts this. It is actually reported. (laughs) Like, you are not going to believe this. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. So this so this is so jacked up, not even... The pagan Gentiles put up with this. And here's what it was. That a man has his father's wife. You say, wow, that's crazy. That's not going on. That's going on today. It was going on then in the church. And and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you who are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. So this is so messed up that a Christian, he's a Christian, sleeping with his father's wife, and Paul says, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Is that what you want done to you? Is that what we want done to these people? You have no grounds for it. You have a disagreement. Oh, that team is corrupt. 
I really hate to break this to you, to everybody. From what I've observed in my limited time on the planet, all the teams are corrupt. You're defending your team because you like their positions or something. I get it, but be careful. You won't defend the cross, but you'll defend team whatever. Then go down to verse 11, verse, verse Corinthians 5, 11. But now I have written to you not to keep company. Now, this is where it gets really broad. So this is what he's saying beyond the guy sleeping with his dad's wife. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, so someone that is a Christian, who is sexually immoral or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Who's going to survive that? And are we really living according to Scripture? You say, well, my gosh, why would you do that? Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The third story, the prodigal son, who was a son when he left, the father does not go looking for that boy. Because that boy's got to get to the end of himself and decide to come home. Some people either go home or they come home, but they got to make up their mind. And it takes a lot of patience not to go hunting them down when that's not what is going to fix it. Because in the story of the prodigal son, it says, and when he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go to my father. So if you ever come to, again, you're either going to come to here and repent and get on with your life, or you're going to come to there and go, ooh, I guess my number got pulled. Romans 12. Um, now these verses are very encouraging for me because I'm a human being and I do have preferences as well. And this is what it says, 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. You say, but they don't want to. That's not what it says. As much as lies in you, live peaceably. Well, they want to fight. I don't want to fight. They want to argue. I have no interest in arguing. You want to have a discussion, a, a coherent discussion, exchange ideas? I'm all about that. Well, I'm angry. We're probably not going to get anywhere. The other thing, don't, don't argue with a drunk. That is the biggest waste of time in the world. Right? The second I figure out somebody's drunk, I go, you know what? God bless you, dude. We'll talk about this another time. Romans 14, 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. So are we pursuing things that make for peace and things that edify another person? Now, let's say that you honestly believe you're 100% right about whatever your position. You don't have to get defensive in order to speak to the issue. And let's say you believe biblically you're right, and the person on the other side of the argument is just wrong. What is your responsibility? To love them anyway, to pray for them, to be patient with them, to plant some seeds, exchange some ideas. Because ultimately, when I really change, the kind of change, not just change what I'm doing to make someone else happy, when God changes me, it is the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart, in my mind, that ultimately manifests in my life. So you are not going to change anyone. You're going to give them things to think about and chew on. But if you're chewing on them more than you're giving, some, giving them something to chew on, they're going to stiff arm us and say, I don't even want to talk about it. And then you lose them even longer. Because they're fighting you instead of exchanging ideas and trying to find out what the truth is. 
Pursue things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. 2 Corinthians 13. Verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So these are the things. He's, he's on his way out from being with them and says, you know, one mind, live in peace. Um, I got enough trouble dealing with the world without having war in here. Right? We don't need war. Ephesians 4, just a few more and then we're done. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Look at those words. That's not suiting up for battle with some other Christian. Walk worthy of the calling that you were called, lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So back to Jesus' prayer in John 17, that they be one. You see, ah, oh, but I don't want to be one. If we're going to be one, let's be my one. It's not us and them, it's him. Philippians 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus." 1 Peter chapter 3, down in verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. You know, it's really not hard to find the adults in the room. They're not defensive. They're not reactive. They're mature. They respond. They listen. They think through the deal. Um, you know, if you're a parent, how many times have your kids just gone off, and if you've got a brain, you sit there and say, okay, so tell me about it. Well, I you know, and if you engage with them all, you're, that's so stupid, and you know, now you have a war in your house. Listen to them. Let them cool off. Be merciful. So that's how you feel. Yeah, that's how I feel. It's not fair. It's not right. Well, what are we going to do about it? My dad was six foot nine at his height, and he had a temper, and he was a fireball. Uh, he had experienced some pain, an uncle that I will meet in heaven. Uh, my dad was about 13, and his big brother died of cancer at Baylor preparing to be a medical missionary. And I think that weighed on my dad. But my dad had a temper, big man, and he would come in all hot and bothered. My grandfather was a pastor going back for generations, but um, my grandfather, I look forward to seeing him again. He had such life and such peace and such power. He smiled so intensely that his eyes squinted and beams of light came out of his head. Joy, peace, powerful man. And my dad would go in to my grandfather's office, and my dad would be going off and upset. And uh, 
my grandfather, my dad would tell this story that my grandfather would say, well, Perry, come over here very calmly. Come over here. Let's get down here on our knees and talk to Jesus about it. And my dad said, I was not going in there to talk to Jesus. I had no interest in talking to Jesus about anything. I was upset. Be the grown-up in the room. Listen. Even if the person's wrong, listen. Well, but I don't want to go to church with them. I probably don't want to go to church with you either then. Because of how you're treating somebody who may actually be wrong. So, as much as I like this Brazil jersey, as it turns out, I got me a new jersey. You say, but you got the other one on. It may peek out here and there. I might show you like. You go read the end of Revelation, chapter 7, I think chapter 9. We're all going to end up dressed in white. New Jersey. Made possible by the blood of the Lamb. And there we are going to be okay. Because we'll have a new heart, new mind, new everything. But what Jesus prayed for is that somehow we would figure out how to be a family, how to be one, despite our other team colors. In such a way that the world would know that the Father sent the Son and that the Father loves us like he loves the Son and that they would want a piece of that. And then we get them a New Jersey and show them how it's done. And our Father, I thank you so much for your mercy and your kindness and your patience with us because we are your children if we have been born into your family. And as it turns out, we all individually are a piece of work. And it is extraordinary how you put up with us and listen and watch and allow for consequence to bring us back to yourself. And we appreciate that. Help us extend who you are to the other members of our family and stop behaving like the world who is lost and has no direction and is desperately looking for you and where you have decided to reveal yourself is in us. So Lord, for anybody out there who's listening and has been very confused by what they see and hear, even amongst Christians, um, Father, help us not just apologize to you, but to apologize to them for not being the, the, the team players that we are supposed to be on Team Jesus. And uh, that we have misrepresented who you are and what it's really all about. And that they would see us letting you love us in spite of who we are and who we're not. And that we have love for you, for ourselves, for others and that we are a family, and we'd love to include them as a part of our family and be patient with them, even though it may be really bumpy in the beginning. So, Father, for anybody out there who may literally have blood on their hands and they are, they, they are desperate, completely overwhelmed by their sin, and they don't know where to take it. They don't know that anybody can process it for them. There's no grave dig deep enough. And somehow in your mercy, you have revealed to them today that it's going to be more than okay. Because the penalty of their sin
was put on the precious Lamb of God. And he who knew no sin literally became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, that we might be made right with you, Father. So may somebody in this room or beyond just say, God, I finally get it. I finally see it. I don't know how I missed this. and I, I don't want to spend another millisecond not sure. I'm a sinner. You know it. I know it. I admit it. And I believe that Jesus died on that cross, shed his blood to pay for my sin, was buried and raised from the dead, and he's alive, and I want him alive in me right now. I accept the forgiveness of my sin. I accept eternal life as a free gift. I know I can't pay for any of this, and I know I'm, I don't deserve any of it, but I say yes. I accept. I'm in. Come in me. Change me. Change my, my life. Change my future. Thank you for covering my past, and that I will be with you forever, and help me grow up quick, Lord so that I don't go back to all this nonsense that never worked in the first place. And use me and help me be what's been discussed today. Help me let you love me and me love you and love myself and other people and be a part of a family even that disagrees on some things. But if we agree on the main things, Lord, we can move it forward. Thank you for saving me, uh, for changing my life. And like being born all over again, I have a fresh start. My sins are forgiven. And Father, for those of us who are believers, um, and we are locked into some old jersey, some grievance, some sin, some, some political whatever, and we're more locked into that than we are you, I pray that we would get a new jersey or put the the new one on and live it out in such a way that you would see that we're sincere and the world would see that it works and that you would use us, Lord, use your body, use the church to change the world. You are their only hope and you left us here to proclaim that. So help us be about that. We love you, Lord. Clearly we can't, not, we can't do this without you. None of us are nice enough or kind enough or smart enough. Um, and left to ourselves, we will back into our corners and come out fighting. And that's not what you intended. So help us not be those people. Help us love one another the way you intended. And we uh, look forward more every day to being there with you. And our prayers even so. Come Lord Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.